Thanks. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we are doing a conference today real quick. Let me just, uh, can someone click continue on that computer over there so you guys are aware that you're being recorded? All right. That's a first for the VA. And then minimize that screen too. Minimize, no, minimize the, uh, yeah, there you go. All right, cool. So uh, we're doing conference today. We're doing an ICU conference. These are two cases from uh, the last couple weeks here at the VA. Uh, one from when I was attending a couple weeks ago and then another one uh, from this past weekend. Um, both highlight two sort of separate, uh, but pretty common ICU problems. So with that, let's get started. We're gonna talk about the first case. Uh, so this is Kansas's like cartoon state quarter. Kansas has like a Buffalo on it with some sunflowers. That's all I know about Kansas. Um, it's, pretty it's pretty flat. It's pretty flat. So if you like, you can you can attest. How did I do with the uh, how did I do with the quarter, Levi? Very accurate. Thanks. I, I I appreciate that. All right. All right, cool. Um, so this is our first case. So this one is a, this is a nurse triage note from the ED. Patient comes to the ER bay with three days of worsening shortness of breath with a COPD history. Uh, patient 90% on room air with no observable increased work of breathing. That's, he does have work of breathing. That's not what that says. Uh, also reports a sore throat and loss of voice since last night. Uh, so what do you guys think? What does this sound like? I think he aspirated a coin. Great, Rachel. You're just calling the shot, trying to blow this up as soon as possible. Why do you think he aspirated the coin? Yeah, he's not even breathing. He's uh, they rolled a corpse to the bay. Yeah, that's great, Rachel. So what Rachel highlighted was that. Um, <laughs> He, he has a sore throat, hoarse voice, and so she's sort of like localizing this to something in and around his vocal cords, uh, some sort of process in that area. That's great. Uh, so his vitals, he's on room air. Everything else is basically baseline for this gentleman, but he's a little bit hypertensive. We're going to go through the same info that the ED had. Uh, and so the ED, the next thing that pre-populates in all of their notes is a medication list. So that's his medication list right there. You guys look at that for a second. All right, so that's his med list while you take that in. And then we also get a past medical history in the ED before we even get a physical exam. All these things pre-populate. Dementia, COPD, he's got recurrent DVTs and PEs. He's had a CVA, he's got HEFREF, iron deficiency anemia, and a couple of other chronic issues. Uh, Rachel, because you astutely thought this man may have an airway obstruction, do these, uh, does this past medical history and med list make you more or less concerned about that possibility? Um. More. And why more? Um, because And why do those make you more concerned that this could be an airway issue? Great. So he's got reflux. And so does he have some existing issue with like aspiration? That's great. I actually hadn't even thought about that when preparing this conference. Perfect. And then does anyone else want to take a shot at that medical history? What on that medical history makes you concerned this gentleman may have uh, aspirated something? Dementia. Dementia. Right, so dementia, prior CVA. So we don't know anything about his prior neuro deficits, but two things that could certainly make you more likely to aspirate. BPH as well. He's got such an obstructed prostate that he's <laughs> straining. I like that. I like that. All right. So next thing that's obtained is a chest x-ray. Um, the ED is going through this sort of rapid fire because they had the same thought process that Rachel did. And I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to a minute to take a look at this chest x-ray. All right, we're going to go fast here because someone said abnormal, which means someone read this. So what is the abnormality on this chest x-ray? A coin lesion. Great. And so where, uh, Levi, where is that? Just so we all. There you go. Nice. So there is something, there is a, uh, some sort of like foreign body uh, on this x-ray.
Yeah, that's great. I think Levi uh, hit on the next question I have, which is like making sure you're not missing other stuff that's going on with this gentleman. So this guy does have hyper expanded lungs, right? He's got some flattened diaphragms. He has sort of more full, full pulmonary vasculature than you might expect. And then he does have some increased interstitial markings, which is great. And so just keeping your differential broad, even though at this point, right, you're concerned that he may have a thing in his uh, airway. I'd also caution you guys, right, this x-ray doesn't tell you if this is inside of his airway, this is a one view, so that could always be on top of the person's body, in which case we're sort of working with a different uh, thought process. All right, what do you guys wanna do next? You get this x-ray, uh, what additional imaging do we obtain? A lateral, great. So, right, we can, we can answer that question about where this is pretty quickly by getting a lateral, and we do indeed get a lateral, and that is the lateral. All right, so we don't look at a lot of lateral x-rays of the neck, um, but where do we think that uh, that coin is based on, based on anatomy? Defer to actually our students in the room who are a little bit closer to upper airway anatomy than some of us. Like at the level of the thyroid cartilage? Great, so is this the level of the thyroid cartilage? I like that. And so what in the airway is at that level? Great, so the vocal folds are probably somewhere in this area, which is great. What is this structure up here and this right here? Great, it's the epiglottis. So we know this is at least below the epiglottis, which also fits with, um, with what we just heard. So below the epiglottis, but not sort of inside the thoracic cavity yet. And that dividing line is usually the vocal folds or the cords. All right, so. Additional imaging, do you guys, are you done? Do you have enough information to diagnose this man? Send him home with rack follow-up? <laughs> <laughs> or is there additional imaging you'd like to obtain? Bronk, great. Poem says, why would we bronk this man? You haven't gotten a CT yet. We'd like to know exactly where this is. Yeah, you could theoretically. Yeah, there was a ENT attending on call over the or ENT team on call over the weekend. You could ask for that. That's great. So that would be one parallel. Let's just do a direct observation and go from there. Great. So this man needs a CT. He gets a CT of his neck because we're not going down the direct ENT pathway. And here is a CT of his neck. All right, and someone just call out when they see the abnormality. The suspense is palpable. Oh. Great, so that right there, right, is an artifact because we are um, looking at something that shouldn't be in the body. So what would create an artifact that bright? Great, so something metal. And so that's actually a pretty good diagnostic clue here that, that something metal is gonna give you an artifact that bright, right? So if someone has a prosthetic limb or a joint, um, that will also light up the same color. So the, this, the thing that is in this gentleman's airway is the consistency of metal or has metal in it and is sort of like on the far, far end of the Hounsfield scale. All right, so yeah, Dr. Young. Can I just insert a quick teaching point here? Um, uh, we often think about our diagnostic test as like I order it and then it shows up in the computer and I read it. Um, and as physicians, we don't always think about like what's in between there. And for our critically ill patients, I think you like really want to be cognizant of like what's the in between and what's the risk of actually just going to get the test. Um, so this guy may have been in the ED and then just got CT on the way up. But I think you can make an argument here if he was in the intensive care unit. Um, to send him half a mile away to CT scan, put him on his back. Um, that, like, this could get worse at any moment if that flips and then moves to a fully obstructed point. You think, gosh, I would not want to be managing that in a radiology suite half a mile from the ICU. So, so I think for any of your critically ill patients that you're thinking about, hey, let's send him for a head CT, let's send him for this or that, you know, really be thinking about like, is the value of this study so high that it's worth it? Because there might be some risk there. Presumably he got this on his way up to his ICU. If he was in the unit, I'd probably say like, the Brock seems to be the lesser of two evils. Like to send him all the way for a CT and put him at risk to bring him back, just to see what we already think is there clinically and radiographically. So 
I don't know if he got this on his way from ED to ICU or what, but. He did, yeah. So that's a great teaching point by Dr. Young. Um, this gentleman, actually, the team asked for this to be done. It's my understanding the accepting team or physician over the weekend asked for it to be done before he came up to the unit because they were concerned about this thing. So for logistical stuff here, our scanners behind the ED for those that have never been there. Uh, so all the CT scans are over there, and that is the exact opposite side of the building from where we currently are. Dr. Keller. I'm just curious why CT. Like, what, what does, what other, I mean, they knew it was a metallic object based on x-ray, right? Because it's hyper intense. As compared to the photo, hyper mm -hmm. uh, So why even bother with the CT? Like we already know it's kind of this regional area. Like of course with the scatter and everything here with the metallic object on CT, we have no idea. Like it's not telling us what the anatomical structure is around it. Like, is there something else with it? Like I guess my question is why bother? Like we we know this already. There's clearly a metallic object, whether it's a coin or a battery, in the patient's area. Yeah, great question. Why, why, why? I so I was playing I was playing devil's advocate when you asked for the laryngoscopy, um, but this man probably did not need it, like you said. Um, and so uh, the ED got this when there was still some sort of like diagnostic confusion, I believe, and sort of hadn't like put the whole picture together. Um, and that was why. But yes, Palm later on did say that they probably could have just done this at the bedside in the ICU with anesthesia without like, you know getting even an unnecessary scan. But there was still some diagnostic dilemma at this point, which is my understanding as to why it was done. We didn't have the lateral yet. Yeah, there was no lateral. And so it was sort of a, just as a reminder to like get the lateral, there was the front image. They didn't know if it was inside the body. They got the CT confirmed it. Then they got the lateral afterwards. Amanda just clarified that timeline for me. Thank you. Oh, okay, so the x-ray lateral. So always get a lateral is your teaching not, point there. How fast is the donor to the crew how bad is dementia? Like you didn't say, like. Yeah, so his his dementia uh, was pretty bad, um, and I think there was a disconnect between the gentleman's family and him about how bad it really was, and so um, it was very difficult to get a history up right. until like many hours after the fact when the scan was done. Because this could have, like, if he if he wasn't in some like severe dementia, it would have been pretty different. Yeah. Exactly. So he had, he had pretty bad dementia. So there was no history initially that he would have swallowed something. So here's the lateral on the CT just to show uh, two different views of that artifact. He's got this sort of like collar sign. I made that up. It's not called the collar sign, but <laughs> looks like he's wearing a collar on the first one. And then you can see the artifact is actually black on the lateral. I have no idea why that is. Um, but this is a pretty good representation of that lateral x-ray. You can see his epiglottis right here, right? You can see uh, the quarter down here, and then the black is actually obscuring the cords because uh, it's sort of all in that same area. All right, so you guys have sort of already guessed this, but what do you want to? Th what do you think is about to come out of this man's airway? 1972 quarter. 1972 quarter. I like it. Threw a date down. How many quarters are about to come out of his airway? I'd say a dollar. Dollar twenty-five, right? So five quarters coming out of this man's airway. So right before, right before the bronch was done, this was the additional history that was obtained. The patient, um, the grand, the wife told us that she left the quarters on the table while the gentleman was eating cookies. She came back to the room and the cookies were there, but the quarters were missing. Uh, he had shortness of breath overnight, and then she finally brought him in because he was getting worse. So with that in mind, Dr. Chan, Dr. York, and the uh, anesthesiologist over the weekend went in and found two quarters uh, basically sitting uh, completely wedged right above this gentleman's vocal cords. So this right here is his vocal cord on one side. That's a vocal cord on the other side. And these quarters are basically pushed together sitting directly above those. Great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, this actually, for one, right, we now know exactly how wide his trachea and his airway is because the quarters fit pretty snugly. And then, yes, how he's still breathing and how these didn't go further or how he didn't cough these up or something um, is pretty impressive. So actually, it was pretty difficult for uh, the pulmonary team to get this out. So they actually brought in anesthesia and used a rigid bronchoscope to pull these out because they could not get uh, a forceps in otherwise. And so it took a, a little bit of time to get this out, but these were removed and the patient did okay. The two quarters in the airway, uh, eight quarters instead of cookies. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, great question. Evan, why would you want to do a KUB? 
Awesome. And so to complete our, like, you ate something you did it, you shouldn't have workup, which we don't see a lot in medicine, they did get a KUB and there was nothing. Um, there is one other, like, incidental finding. There is one other incidental finding, if anyone can notice it on here, a chronic finding this gentleman has, which is abnormal. Um, but there are no other coins. What device is that? Yes, so this right here is a misplaced ICD filter that the gentleman has had for quite some time. Uh, if you look at the CT scan, this is what his uh, blood vessels are doing. That's basically his um, branching uh, of his iliacs, I wanna say. It's been a long time since I did anatomy, um, but this is a misplaced IVC filter that he has had for quite some time, but it is not a uh, swallowed foreign object. All right. Can I ask you a pimpy question? Yes. Nothing better than pimping the cheek. So, because you're going to be a pump fellow. I don't know if I have the answer to this, but I'm interested. So, those quarters look like they're like 10 degrees away from basically folding over and like closing his airway. Mm -hmm. So, if he became acutely worse, what would be your next move? Good question. I'm going to pull the uh, time-tested chief card and defer that to the room first. And see, what the, <laughs> see what the room thinks. I think I have an idea as to what I would do. Uh, but to the room, what would you guys do if this man's airway acutely closed off because the quarters flipped into a horizontal position? Yeah, Great. So I think the question would be a surgical airway if you couldn't. Uh, I think the answer would probably be a surgical airway if you could not you weren't in the airway at the time able to remove these things because you're not gonna be able to grip anything if it's completely flat uh, sitting on top of his vocal cords. And so a surgical airway would be the answer. Um, please call an attending or fellow. Uh, <laughs> I will then call an attending in the future, but please call an attending if that needs to happen. Yeah, it just, it brings up, like we, we think about like, oh, somebody's in respiratory distress, I ventilate them, but you have these unique scenarios where if you're suddenly, your upper airway becomes compromised, that's no longer an option. And that's what we have to think about practically thyroidotomy. And I imagine for the intensivist, It'd be tempting to be like, let me just get in there and yank these out. But um, man, if you don't get them out in you know 10 seconds or 20 seconds or less, you're in trouble. So I imagine it's secure the airway first, deal with the obstruction second um, is the safest way to go. So I really hope that never happens when I'm around. <laughs> yeah, not a great situation. Uh, Levi, do you have another question? Yeah, so you know the book of course acts as like a nice stop point in narrowing of the airway. Um, before it then gets into the trachea. But I guess my other concern would be like if we had to localize these like if they were maybe distal to the cords, like a surgical airway would become really problematic, honestly, because like once you get to right past the cords, you're like if the cords are like this distal to the cords, you're kind of like that was like how do you know that you're actually probably be above or below the cord? They're wedged in bottom of trachea, like yeah. At the Karanians, uh, that's, that's a tough situation. That is a very specific situation that uh, you should you should you should call. Uh, in that case, you should call ENT and thoracic surgery because that that requires that requires more than uh, a bedside bronchoscopy. All right. Uh, so we got quarters in the airway. So two quarters in the airway. Uh, another plug for uh, you know good geriatric care uh, and sort of like home safety, which uh, the family worked on after this man was discharged. All right. So the next case is going to be a gentleman who um, unfortunately passed away this past weekend, but has a couple of good teaching points. Uh, that is a buffalo covered in snow. That's my attempt at a buffalo covered in snow. So 66 year old man with uh, emphysema and prior tobacco use admitted on 519 with COVID-19 pneumonia, initially admitted on room air and seemed pretty well. And then his hospital course here is laid out. Uh, the next day he's on one to two liters. Things are appearing to be fine. He gets started on all of the goal directed therapy that we have in COVID. So dexamethasone, remdesivir. 521, he's transitioned to he high flow nasal cannula and transitioned to the ICU. He gets his first dose of tocilizumab that day. Uh, 522, he's still not improving. He gets dose of tocilizumab times two. He's eventually intubated on 527. 528, he completes his course. and 529, he starts the fever. His vasopressor requirements are intermittently increasing, and he has started on antibiotics. So things are, things are getting worse, obviously. Just to hammer home uh, this gentleman's course, let's just take a look at his imaging here. This is his initial chest x-ray which doesn't look super bad. I think we can all agree on that. This is not our classic like COVID x-ray. His next x-ray, he actually gets a CT that day as well. 
because uh, people were sort of unsure if he was really, uh, like what was going on because the CT didn't look that bad. And so what uh, pathologic abnormalities are you guys seeing on the CT? Great, he's got emphysema. So we'll play that one more time. Just a pretty good, pretty good view of emphysema in the upper airways, those sort of cystic air spaces that have been enlarged. So this is CT day one, so internalize this view. And when he gets worse on day three, another CT is obtained. This is also to make sure he doesn't have a PE as well. Ignore the blue arrow. So better, worse, the same. Worse. worse. And if you guys were going to grade this, like much worse, a little bit worse, substantially worse. Yes, yeah, so this looks this looks awful. And so uh, between the span of two to three days while getting dexamethasone, this gentleman gets substantially worse uh, in terms of his airway. But right this time, he's still just on heated high flow. All right. So that's worse. He then gets another chest x-ray after that. Uh, this is when he's in the ICU, he's prone to this point. So right, this is a prone image. In case you're wondering how I know that, it says prone. <laughs> um, so please always be on the lookout for that so you know your lines are on the right side. And, and this looks bad, um, but it sort of was unchanged from prior that had been happening about 24 hours before. All right, so this gentleman is getting worse in the ICU. And at this point, bad stuff starts to happen. So Jess Coulter is called by the nurse overnight to come to the room uh, for a uh, potential code blue event. So um, he has progressive oxygenation issues on the vent, uh, but no increased peak or plateau. While the nurses are bagging in an attempt to clear mucus plugs and get a culture for a diagnosis, because there was a concern this gentleman had a ventilator associated pneumonia, his SATs dropped to the low 80s, his heart rate decreased, and then he became hypotensive. Jess uh, immediately did the right thing and asked for him to be uh, flipped over. They did not palpate a pulse and CPR was initiated. Um, and we're gonna start here. So what I want you guys to do is take like a minute-ish at your tables and give me uh, your top three things that could be causing this gentleman to uh, suddenly have a cardiac arrest. All right, we're back. Uh, some good discussion. Um, middle table, Dr. Klump, you'll be in this position in the future. Uh, what are your thoughts if you're standing in this room when the person gets flipped over, right? You've got like 15 seconds while they're being flipped or so to like get your thoughts in order. What's your like top three differential for why this person coded? Uh, top three differential, well, I mean, he's having a hypoxic hypoxia. Um, so okay. Why he's hypoxic? That's all right. Someone else can jump in and help her. Her first two are great. Those are perfect first two initial thoughts. Dr. Keller. I mean, I think it's just generalized, like things that can cause large collapse in somebody that's mechanically ventilated. So if you could plug or if you could remove that information that can cause more lung to really have your ventilation that can cause some of those symptoms. Awesome. PE pneumothorax, low bar collapse. I like it. Uh, anyone else have any additional thoughts here about things you'd consider H's and T's, like right when you flip them over? Anita. Like Samphalon syndrome. Um, if he's looking at Um And then just also, like, because he was prone and they flipped him, like, was his tube change? Great. Like the mechanical. 
Great. So like, so I think Anita's getting at an important thing here where it's right, like, what did we do to this person and could that have played a role, right? Flipping and proning people are very uh, fraught scenarios. And so I think having that in mind, like, did he code after he was flipped because something else happened? Levi. Uh, and so I think the interesting thing here about this is there can be something that could distract the increased heat per flash. And I think like one asynchronous or is he actually breathing I like that. He is paralyzed now, which which makes these a little bit more believable. But yes, um, and the other thing I would point out, right, your peaks or plaques uh, are helpful. But if someone is being bagged, we um, we are changing their peaks and their plateaus when we are bagging them. So we are increasing their mean airway pressure every time we push a uh, breath in. Um, one thing I'm going to have Dr. Young talk about, how do you think about um, a person who is pulseless and in the prone position? Yeah, before we jump to that, I think um, uh, anything about here of this data make, is anything up there make a respiratory event significantly more likely? I should say there is something about this that makes a respiratory, primary respiratory event much more likely. Take a guess. Besides them having COVID and everything else, something that tells you this is most likely a respiratory event causing this cardiac arrest. So the VSATs preceding, preceding raises your probability. Something else that might be more specific. Maybe purple. Purple is a good one. Uh, uh, so all signs that tell you. Uh, Things are tenuous from a respiratory standpoint, but in terms of that, we see people with um, COVID who um, are tenuous from a respiratory standpoint all the time. But specifically, the fact that that's driving this particular arrest is his heart rate. Um, so you see his heart rate drops from 120 to 80s to 70s. Um, so if you are clinically unstable and you have lowering pressures into the 60s, the normal physiologic response is to augment your heart rate. Um, so the AHA actually in recent guidelines has suggested that we actually sort of stratify PEA as bradycardic or tachycardic for this reason. Because um, when you see somebody who is um, hypotension, tensive slash pulseless, and you see bradycardia, that tells you they have too much vagal tone. Um, and so about 20% of in-hospital arrests are primary respiratory, respiratory events um, that have a surge in vagal tone. And then you see it on the monitor when you get PEA, no pulse, but their heart rate's only 60 or 70. You're like, well, that's weird. Why isn't it 150? Like, why aren't they trying to overcome? So that, that tells you that likely from some respiratory issue, all these are potential possibilities, had a surge in vagal tone. So um, they call this the mammalian diving reflex. Um, and so all of us, if we are apneic or have primary sort of like apnea and our CO2 starts rising, um, we have a surge in vagal tone that lowers our heart rate. Um, interns, if you've cross covered, you probably know this because you get called. It's like, hey, Mr. Jones, his heart rate's 35. And you're like, what's he doing? And there's like, he's snoring. And they say, ah, yes, that's his sleep apnea. So we see various manifestations of this, um, but it, it comes out in major form in, in cardiac arrest. So I think you can say he has likely had a primary, some sort of respiratory event. Could be a ventilator kinking, could be a low bar collapse, could be all sorts of stuff. Um, so then the question of like, what do you do if your patient goes pulseless? and they are prone. Um, so you can do CPR in the prone position. Um, so you can do CPR in the prone position. You basically um, push on the spine and like, uh, what is it, T7, T9, like basically more or less same, like just on the other side. There's data that you can generate um, equally and maybe better for fusing pressures and doing that way. Uh, but it adds a lot of complexity in terms of like pulse assessment, access, other things. So the general recommendation is basically to initiate prone CPR so that you're not waiting. Um, initiate prone CPR so you have enough people in the room to sort of supinate um, really quickly and effectively so that you can do it um, without a prolonged uh, um, gap in CPR. Wow, that was great. Mm -hmm. uh... I have never heard of the mammalian diving reflux before, and now I am gonna tell everyone I know. Uh, that's amazing, uh, that was amazing. Great, thank you, Dr. Young. And so this gentleman, uh, Jess Coulter, presumably rightly thought this gentleman was having a primary respiratory arrest. They get ROSC a couple times, he loses pulses, they eventually get a more sustained ROSC, and they get a uh, chest X-ray. And this is what it shows. 
So someone can just scream out, what is the, the there's a tension pneumo. pneumo, great. So this, right, this chest x-ray should not exist. That's what we always say, but like, that's hard, right? Cause as residents, we're not gonna put, we're not gonna do a needle decompression ourselves overnight for the most part. So the surgery APP comes in and puts in a chest tube and this gentleman's uh, oxygenation gets better. So post chest tube, um, this is what it looks like. I talked to Jess and he just said it was wild because right when she put it in, it was just like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is what Ania is saying. So post yeah. post uh, chest tube, his lung re-expands. Mm -hmm. And so in talking to the pulmonary fellow who was uh, taking care of this person, they're not sure if he had a tension pneumo initially or if it was something else that caused this, like an acidosis. But he definitely had one by the end of the code, either from CPR or the primary event, which may have been why he kept losing pulses after they regained pulses. So sort of to Dr. Young's point, probably a combination of a respiratory thing and something else or two separate respiratory things. Okay, so this gentleman has ROSC, he's paralyzed, so you can't get a neuro exam. Do we need to cool him? Yes. Who thinks yes, we should cool this gentleman? Who thinks we should not cool this gentleman? Megan, why don't you think we should cool him? Say it again. Cool, great. So should we, is it, the question is like, do we just cool if they're primary cardiac arrest? Does anyone, what do other people think in the room? I thought it would be cool if we're out of hospital cardiac arrest. Okay, cool yeah. if we're just out of hospital cardiac arrest. This yeah. is great. Do, do CPR immediately, or immediately. This is great. All right, can we have any other thoughts in the room? This is great. This is what I, this is what I wanted. I've also been in the NICU for in-hospital hypoxic arrest. Yes. So it makes it really, really easy. You actually don't have to think about this. If they do not have a neuro exam after their arrest, you should cool them. So this is the VA's therapeutic hypothermia protocol straight from a binder this morning. And so here's our, here's our inclusion criteria at the VA, which is basically our inclusion, inclusion criteria at all sides. A witnessed arrest with return of ROSC in less than 30 minutes and you're unresponsive and you're on a ventilator. If you meet those criteria, you should be cooled. Exclusion criteria are refractory shock on two vasopressors. Physician says they shouldn't be cooled. You've been uh, arresting for a while. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, don't be that person if they meet the inclusion criteria. Uh, known coagulopathy, we'll talk about why that is in a second. They have a DNR, DNI, obviously, and pregnancy. Um, we just don't have enough data on, on pregnant women uh, to know that. Uh, good question. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, so Levi's bringing up thought of vasoplegia. So this is the therapeutic hypothermia protocol. So people should be cooled. And so what I want everyone to do, so first table over there, you guys are going to tell me how you're going to induce cooling and what method you want to use. Middle table, you're going to tell me the maintenance phase. So how long do you want to cool them for? And then the table I'm sitting at, you guys are going to tell me how long do you want them to be rewarmed for? And what do you want their temperature to be after they've rewarmed?
All right, let's come back. Some good discussion. Uh, this is why we're, why we're doing this. All right, so the Grogan Keller, uh, what do you guys want to, how do you want to induce this person? How cold do you want to get them? And uh, what device do you, would you ideally want to use? So we talked about device first. So I guess our options are like the external cooling versus maybe the data is better for external if we can get people cold faster. Mm -hmm. um, and then temperature target, I think it's either like 32, yeah, start at 33, or 33, 33 or 36. We start at 33 and if you develop complications from it, you can come up to 36. I think it's like that too. Yeah. And I mean, you cool up six hours. Don't say that yet. That's the maintenance phase. Don't, don't overstep. <laughs> That's great. Um, so yeah, so kind of brought up a good point. So at DH, we do intravascular cooling. So the names you guys have probably heard thrown around. That's the Zoll device. Zoll is a company that makes pacemakers and like devices, but that's what we call it a Zoll. Uh, external devices. We use external devices at UCH, and we do external devices at the VA. So uh, this depends on where you are at, but it's still good to think about the differences between the Why two. Uh, good question. I think it's. Uh, personal practice patterns between like people who oversee the ICUs. Yeah. Um, so names, names for the names for the externals that you might have heard are the Arctic Sun. And then the one we use here, I'm not going to write it. It's called a Cincinnati sub zero, which like, I don't know, I don't know what to make of that. Um, Arctic yeah, sun is yeah. the, the Arctic the Arctic sun is confused. The Arctic sun can heat and warm, which I think is where the sun comes from. So it's an Arctic and it's a sun. That's me extrapolating. Uh, but Con Connor brought up a good point. So he said that he thinks, or Levi thinks that there might be some data that external gets you to your target temperature faster. So I want people to raise their hand. Who thinks the external device of putting pads on someone gets you to your target temperature faster? I'm going to say yes, because he's like, <laughs> okay. And who thinks who thinks intravascular cooling gets you to your target temperature faster? So the correct answer is that intravascular actually gets you to your target temperature faster. There was a trial called the TT840 or sorry TTH or TTM48 trial or TTH48, and it's a, it's a subgroup from that. But essentially, you get about two hours faster in your intravascular uh, group, and that's because you have more control over your temperature and you can lower it faster. So how does the intravascular device work? There are these little coils that surround the catheter and these coils create like a closed loop like gel feedback system. And so you basically have cold water surrounding your catheter that's inside the person's body. And because of that, you can lower their temperature a little bit faster. Um, that being said, there is no difference in outcomes between external devices and intravascular devices. So this speed to temperature doesn't really make a difference we think overall. Uh, the intravascular I've seen it, um... I, I prefer the Arctic Sun. Mm -hmm. uh, does, that, does that have to go through a thermal sheet? Or like, what's the introducer? Yeah, you can see that's a downside. Good question. So this catheter uh, is longer than our other catheters. So you actually put it in the same way as the central line. So this, uh, the actual lumen of it's the same size as your typical uh, central line, but it's surrounded by what looks like sort of like cellophane um, mm -hmm. and like a balloon almost, which fits in and inflates inside the body. Um, so you don't need an introducer. You can put a central line and you can put this in, but you just have to be aware that it's very long and all of the coils need to be in the body. Is that why you usually do fem access? Okay. Yeah. So that's why you that's why you usually do fem access or you do the left IJ at Denver mm -hmm. Health because you need the more room for it to cross over. Yeah. Levi. Hasn't there been some controversy with these rolls like the distal marker? Because it's difficult to see after placement? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Yeah, good question. They are, they're not radio opaque, the ends, uh, and like the, the coils aren't radio opaque, so they are a little bit harder to see, but it looks like a central line once it's in the person. Like you just can't, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, and then they also all have five uh, ports, so you can still use a central line essentially. You don't have to put a second central line in. Remember that. And then the uh, the external device, these uh, pads are all hooked to a, to a central temperature feedback system. So you set your temperature and then gel, which is cooled, circulates through the pads that you have put on the person's body. All right, so the question then becomes 33 or 36. So maintenance group, what do you guys think? Oh, I thought we were talking about times. Um, so you get times, or so you, you can do that. Yeah, times. Oh, okay. How long do you want to cool for first? We'll, we'll have the question I actually ask you. Um, 24 hours, we typically put like some studies in cool for 60 days. Okay. Nice, and what did that study show? Oh, I don't know, probably no difference. 
Yeah, so this like TCH48 trial looked at 24 versus 48 hours and they found that 48 had more adverse neuro outcomes. So Tessa's correct. So you wanna cool for 24 hours at your target temperature. And that target temperature based on a study from uh, Europe a few years ago called the Targeted Temperature Management Trial, the TTM uh, 33 versus 36. Anyone wanna take a guess what they found? No difference at all. So this is their uh, data here. So their protocol, right? They cooled you for 24 hours or 28 in this study to 37. Um, or uh, to less than 37, or presumably, um, sorry, you were rewarmed to 37, but you were less than 33 or 36. If you had to have a GCS less than eight, right, no neuro exam, most were witnessed, most were outside the hospital. Uh, I think this was in Sweden or in Austria where they have a very fast time to BLS. Um, and overall, right, they found no difference in mortality or neuro outcomes between 33 and 36. So the question then is, our protocol here is 33, Denver Health is 33, UCH sort of varies, why is that? And the answer is that we now have like a lot of emerging data that people who get cooled to 33 have better neurologic outcomes. So this is a study from UW uh, that came out in the past year where they looked at basically like 400 to 500 people in their hospital who had arrests. And notably what they found, if you look into it, is they found that favorable neurologic outcome uh, was better in people who were cooled to 33 versus 36. And so there's some theory that the longer down you are, the colder your brain needs to be in order to appropriately heal. And so that's why you're seeing sort of more practice patterns emerge now that we're cooling people to 33 as opposed to 36. That being said, I told Dr. Young, there's a study that should come out this summer where they're gonna look at 33 versus avoiding fever. Um, because as Levi said, the real big thing here is you really just don't want these people to have a fever at any point during their course. Yeah, why do you say that Levi? It's pretty high, like it's almost 50% of their, their cardiac arrest survives. Dr. Young, do you have info on our numbers here? Higher than that here. Yeah, so we're, yeah, so we're significantly higher than that here. I want to say it's like 50 to 60 percent, 50 percentage survive um, arrest. Um, I'm sorry, 60 percentage survive arrest. And then it's like were these in, in hospital. hospital. Yeah. Oh, were, these, were these all in hospital? No, these are, these are um, out of hospital. Out of hospital, no, sorry. Out of hospital is much, much lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yes, out of hospital is much, much lower. But um, our in hospital arrest is here, like I think, surprisingly high for people, particularly if you have a shockable rhythm, you know, rates are um, well above 60, 70 percent. So, but it's still something people who got ROS. Yeah, yeah, because uh, if you if you don't get ROS, then you don't you don't have to you don't have to cool, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're deceased. Yeah. Um, okay, so finally, rewarming group. What do you guys want to rewarm to, and how fast? Right, one EBM point Yes. Um, uh, so you have this targeted temperature management trial that's a randomized control trial that shows no difference. Then you have retrospective data that says just, ah, oh, there is a difference, which always leads me to the question of, well, what's confounding? Um, and, uh, and so I worry in seeing this and seeing such a striking difference in outcomes, particularly for folks that are like, like a condition that's, it's tough to affect outcomes for people who have this arrest, that I worry a lot about um, uh, how we actually adequately balance for all confounders, specifically if, tar if um, there's a lot more that goes into cooling somebody to 33, um, uh, and I wonder, was that group just more stable at baseline and had less ongoing comorbidities? And we see that reflected in the, in the outcomes there. So I will anxiously await more randomized control trial data before sort of applying this because I am skeptical. Yeah, and I think that's uh, very appropriate. But that's why this TTM2 trial is being completed. Uh, okay, Anita, what do you guys want to cool this person to? Or sorry, what do you want to rewarm them to? Um, so according to up to date, it said 0.25 to 0.5 degrees Celsius every hour. Nice. And that is basically what our rewarming checklist is here. So you want to verify they've been at temperature for 24 hours and you want to rewarm them 0.5 per hour for eight to 12 hours. But notably, right, you want to maintain their temperature, which is why you keep them on the device to avoid rebound hyperthermia, because that's very, very bad for your brain to be febrile at any point after cardiac arrest. So you rewarm them slowly and then you lock them in is what some ICU doctors will say at a 37 or 37.5 degree temperature to make sure they don't fever again. All right, and very last thing here in our cardiac arrest uh, potpourri, what happens when people get cold? So like really cold, like super hypothermic. So there are a lot of complications from that. So take like a minute at your tables and I want you guys to think of as many complications as you can think of for people that are hypothermic.
All right, uh, I got some thoughts here. So uh, people just shout out, what are some complications of being cold? Anyone, open floor. Coagulopathy, all right, coagulopathy. We got coagulopathy, sorry, I, I, my ears turned off. Coagulopathy, what else? Acidosis, great, so like uh, worsening acidosis. Electrolyte abnormalities. Electrolytes, great. What are the electrolyte abnormalities from? Is it the potassium or like what causes mm -hmm. it? I'm not sure. It's you know, cell lysis. Yeah. Crystal, ice crystal. All right. Talk about that in a second. Great. What else? Rhabdo. Rhabdo. Okay. Um, sometimes. Yes. Arrhythmias. Arrhythmias. I like it. And worsening hemodynamics. Cool. So this is the hypothermia complications that are like generally accepted. I didn't include uh, worsening hemodynamics on here because it kind of goes both ways. But shivering, right? The one that we always like, we all just know you get cold when you shiver and you shiver. That's bad though, right? Because shivering produces heat and you want to avoid that. And that's often why you'll see people paralyzed when they're being cooled is because you want to take out shivering if it's a problem. Arrhythmia. So those are the arrhythmia numbers from the TTM trial. Um, so AFib was the most common, but VT happens not infrequently and bradycardia happens as well. They get a cold induced diuresis. And so um, I have no idea why this happens. I've tried to look it up, but basically as we get cold, our bodies try to get rid of fluid. Um, and I think it's mostly because we're like shunting blood back to our core. And as you shunt blood back to your core, you increase renal blood flow. And so this is why people have a low K, a low mag and a low FOS. And so it's the exact same thing as if you're diuresing them in the hospital, they can become volume deplete and electrolyte deplete. They lose insulin sensitivity when they're cold. And so, right, this becomes hyperglycemia. They increase their risk of bleeding. And so if people are actively bleeding when they're coding, that is a contraindication to cooling them. And then we decrease immune function as well. So our white blood cells don't work as well. This gentleman got tocilizumab twice. And so they were concerned that like whatever residual immune function he had left would probably go by the wayside. And this is also why some um, ICU doctors will recommend giving people a mox clav after cardiac arrest times two days, because we have an RCT uh, that showed that this may decrease like an early ventilator associated pneumonia. Do you, do you do that with like, I don't know that with hospital cardiac arrest and do that inpatient cardiac arrest as well? Yeah, good question. I've only ever seen it done for out of hospital. For, uh, this is my like, this is based on anecdote. I feel like for in hospital, the people are often already on antibiotics or they're in shock. And so you're giving them like broad spectrum anyway. Um, but for out of hospital, uh, that's when the study was done. And that's what happens when you're cold. And so uh, these are the things we try to avoid. Uh, and that's why this gentleman was not um, cooled because he was uh, higher risk for bleeding. He had decreased immune function and his hemodynamics were not great. Dr. Young, anything else to add? I don't think so. Uh, anything to add from Team C who took care of this guy? It's kind of a difficult case. I thought he was able to hold it, but I don't know if that was because he was fevering. They tried to avoid fever and they were not able to because yeah, he, so, like, he was so febrile, yeah. yeah. We essentially do like default like fever um, prevention. So they'll put the bear hoggers on and they essentially do like kind of targeted temperature management, essentially like the 36 category for just about everybody who arrests. Um, just because you can do that with just the bear huggers, just cool them without um, uh, the intensity of the full protocol. So, yeah. The thing I wanted to end on, because it's trivial today, and so it should be fun, is a bit of trivia. Uh, does anyone know why this gentleman did not have a, you know, this gentleman obviously has a right-sided pneumothorax. Why does he have no air on the left side of his chest? Like, why does his pneumothorax stay on one side? Oh my gosh, it's well. Yeah. <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about that, Amy. Oh my gosh. Um, there's basically like connective tissue that separates our two lungs versus buffaloes where like we don't have it. So if you shoot a buffalo in the lung, it basically kill them. Yes, so to compare and contrast, if, this, if you go to this gentleman's CT scan right here, you can see that there is tissue separating his mediastinum. So all of us have tissue for the most part separating the two sides of our lung. And this is what a congenital anomaly looks like that doesn't have it. This gentleman had a lung resection, right? That looks weird. Like just like looking at that, you're like something is amiss there. And this is actually what buffaloes always have in their chest or bison. So buffaloes have a single thoracic cavity which is problematic, right? Because if you're a buffalo on the plains and someone is hunting you, all you need to do is put an arrow 
into their chest cavity really at any point and you have a pretty high instance of bilateral tension pneumos. And so that's why um, bison and buffaloes are actually not that hard to kill. I say that as someone who's never killed, <laughs> killed a bison or a buffalo. But like theoretically, theoretically, they're not as hard to kill as other animals their size because of their single thoracic cavity. Also called a buffalo chest. Yeah, so they also do yeah, other things too. Cool, and that's it guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, enjoy Trivia Bowl tonight. And as always, let me know if any questions come up.